my name is Liz Gleason, and you're listening to Shapes of Grief. Shapes of Grief is a curation of stories from ordinary people on their experience of loss, how their grief impacted them, and what helped them to find their feet again. Loss can really have such a profound effect on our lives, and it is my hope that Shapes of Grief will provide comfort, hope, and inspiration to our listeners so that together we can get more comfortable talking about grief. If you like what you hear, please consider becoming a patron of Shapes of Grief on patreon.com. This is a listener-supported podcast, so please do donate, like, share and review. It really does keep us going. For more grief resources and grief support, find and follow us on all the usual social media channels and on shapesofgrief.com. Welcome to this week's episode of Shapes of Grief. Palliative medicine pioneer, Dr. Catherine Mannix joins me today. Catherine, you're so welcome. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here with you and to meet you finally. I heard so much about you, Catherine, and I'm reading your book at the moment with the end in mind, how to live and die well. I know from my few years of working as a bereavement therapist that how somebody dies can make a huge difference to the bereavement outcome for their loved ones. Absolutely. And it's a kind of combination, isn't it, of what the last moments of somebody's life is like, but also what the conversations they've been able to have in preparation for those last moments have been able to be getting those those chats in are very important and often I mean I think that shocked me at the beginning how often we don't talk about the dying process or dying or an upcoming death we avoid it like the plague but recently there does seem to be a sudden explosion on all things death dying and grief I know there's a lot of podcasts now that are coming popping up and blogs and people are just saying this is something that we need to discuss more. This needs to be a conversation that isn't in the shadows and isn't taboo. Would you agree with that, Catherine? Maybe you tell us a little bit about your background and and how you've seen that change over the years. Okay, so yeah, I absolutely agree. It has been taboo um, and it's probably for a, a variety of reasons that maybe we could talk about in a minute. I ended up in palliative care Really, having started off wanting to be a cancer doctor, wanting to be an oncologist in the 1980s, and after working for a few years in hospital medicine, I got a job in the cancer centre, which I was really delighted about. And then I discovered that actually the patients who were really the most interesting to me were not the people who were going to be cured, that there were lots of very clever people trying to find the cure for cancer and that's really important but actually I was much more interested in the people for whom cure was not going to be possible and in the 1980s of course that was a much higher proportion of people with cancer than it would be now and the idea that somehow the time that was left for these people was very precious and that they wanted to be as well as they could be despite the illness that seemed to be something really really important And it was very clear that it wasn't just about them for them. It was about the people who were important to them as well. So they wanted to be as mobile and as pain free and as independent as they could be, because we all value those things, but also so that they could continue to be as much of the person as they had always been in all the roles and relationships they had for as long as possible. So I I was intrigued by that and I was absolutely intrigued by their resilience in facing dying and wanting to do it well. And so around about the same time as I was developing that interest, by public subscription, a hospice was built in my city about four blocks away from where I live. So that was good. So I wrote to them and said, um, and you know what? I, I'm a I'm a doctor with a bit of medical experience, a bit of oncology experience. And do you think you have any uh, roles that I could 
you know, get involved with at your hospice. And they invited me along. And when I got there, to my amazement, it was a job interview. Um, and they'd had this panel that had been interviewing to appoint a consultant that morning. Um, so they gave the panel some lunch and then they interviewed me and offered me a traineeship without the poor consultant having any say in it. <laughs> Luckily, we got on very, very well. So so I got there really by interest and almost by accident. OK. And I love that. I love that you just showed up and it happened to be the day the panel was on. There's uh, something meant to be in all of that story. Catherine, what do you think drew you to this work? Was there something in your own experience that made this an interesting place to be? Or is it just your personality that you were drawn to this? Do you know, I've thought about that, Liz, a lot over the years. I think looking back, I realised that all the way through my medical school training and my early years as a, a very junior doctor before I moved into palliative care, I was always intrigued by and very interested by uh, the patients who were not going to make it, not, not in a ghoulish way, but in a way of admiring their ability to face that. And uh, when I got into my clinical years at medical school, I had a bit of a crisis at that point when I got onto the wards and realised that actually doctors didn't seem to do the kind of work that I wanted to do. They, they did really interesting, clever stuff, but they kind of came in and did stuff and went away again. And the people who had the ongoing day-to-day -day relationships with the patients in hospital were nurses. So I had this kind of crisis where I suddenly thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm training in the wrong profession. I, I should have been a nurse. And I thought for a while about swapping and, and didn't. But the training that I had from nurses, I have to say, has been invaluable to me because they taught me how to be alongside somebody who is dying, where you don't have anything that you can do. The stethoscope is no longer useful, that your fancy dancy drugs haven't got anything to offer yeah. here. What you're doing is accompanying in the way that the person chooses. And nurses do that so beautifully. And the nurses on the wards that I had the good fortune to work on I, may, I don't know whether they recognised that I was interested or whether they just took pity on me, but they mm. definitely brought me alongside with them and enabled me to understand how to be in in that quiet space mm. without having to be doctory. And it's a really interesting point because um, young medical students are trained to fix things. You know, here's the problem and here's the solution and here's how we fix it. And I do, have you read the book Mortally Wounded? I haven't. So it's a great book and it, it sort of does address this, that we are, um, no, is it mortally wounded? Oh, sorry, that's an Irish book I'm thinking of. There's another one. Oh, um, being, being mortal. Being mortal. Being mortal. Exactly. Mortal. I thought the uh, one fantastic. Yes. Book. Yes. And actually, I just have um, Mortally Wounded beside me, which is written by an Irish doctor. And uh, it's, a, it's a similar theme. But um, yeah, being mortal and the struggle of doctors to accept the things that can't be fixed. So it's lovely to know that you came to that conclusion early and realised that that was, um, you know, that, that place of space holding that was much needed that the nurses taught you it, it was a really important thing and when you know as a, a an old and experienced palliative care physician I read Being Mortal by Atul Gawande I, I absolutely loved it and I thought you know this is this is the mission really and his mission is to try to help doctors to accept mortality but the campaign has to be bigger than that because actually doctors are serving people and people themselves have lost sight of our own mortality. I think it's more of a problem in the United States because of the way their health system is structured than it is here. But it's not much less of a problem here. And doctors are trying to rise to the challenge of patients and families saying, oh, try something else, try something else, do something more. Yeah. Yeah, we li we live in a death denying culture for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I listened to one of your YouTube videos earlier, Catherine, and you said something about um, 
you know, we arrange our lives. I think I'm paraphrasing you here. We arrange our lives so that we don't have to think about death or encounter dying. But yet we love death when it's, you know, at a safe distance, when it's on Sky News, when it's a murder mystery. Um, we get a thrill out of it to a degree. I mean, you just have to look at Game of Thrones, which I don't <laughs> follow, but I know there's a lot of gore in it. Um, so we, th there's part of us that's fascinated by it when it's at a safe distance. But okay. when it comes to our door, we, can, we, we really shrink, don't we? We absolutely do. And because we've kind of elevated death as entertainment so much, television and cinema producers give us more death as entertainment, including in soaps and in cinema stories that are supposed to be representing real lives. Um, and yet, obviously, for a dying scene to keep the audience interested, it has to be dramatic. Uh, by definition, these are dramas. And real dying, normal human dying, is very gentle and very undramatic. So we never get to see that on our screens. That's absolutely true. And I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you about that, actually, Catherine. To talk about the dying process, I have had the privilege of accompanying a few of my loved ones now to their death and through their death. But I'd love you just to talk about your experience of it. Gosh, you know, while every birth is unique, every death, I'm sure, is unique, but there are certain similarities that we can learn to look for. And I know you use that analogy. There are certain stages of birth and there are certain stages throughout the dying process also. I'd love you to speak to that, would you, Catherine? Yeah, sure. Absolutely right. But so there's lots of birth stuff on TV, isn't there? The birth is entertainment. It's also enjoying a, a renaissance. And so you can see dramas about birth and you can see documentaries about birth. And every woman who's ever given birth feels she's had a unique experience. And every midwife who's accompanied her has seen the same sequence of events that she always sees at a birth. So that's a really great parallel place to start with talking about dying, where everybody's experience is unique to them, their illness, their relationships, their understanding of themselves, their hopes and fears. But that biological process of events is the same from one human being to the next or from one animal at, of any kind to the next because it is the process of a body shutting down and a brain shutting down and it happens in a particular order. So when we're poorly, even if we're not dying, when we're really poorly, you know, if you've got flu, you just feel so tired that you cannot get out of your bed. So that's real flu as opposed to man flu where you really can't get out of your bed and you just sleep a lot and then intermittently you wake up, you might manage to have a drink and take some paracetamols and then you just, you've, you're exhausted and you need to go back to sleep again. So that's, that's the way that human bodies deal with being really sick. We become sleepy to recharge our energy batteries. And of course, the dying process is the example par excellence of, of that going on. So as time goes by, we find the person we're looking after is spending longer and longer asleep and being awake for shorter and shorter interludes. And during that period, there'll be this interesting transition where during sleep, they will be no longer simply asleep, but dipping in and out of unconsciousness, going in and out of a coma, really. Um, and that's important to know because although the symptoms of dying are simply being more tired and becoming unconscious, the symptoms of the illness that's making us die can still be running in the background, whether that's pain or nausea or breathlessness or whatever. So just as midwives during the antenatal period help mum and baby to be as healthy as they possibly can, so on delivery day, everything's set up for the delivery to run smoothly. So during the final weeks and months of life, it's quite important to have the symptoms of our terminal illness or illnesses properly looked after so that the symptoms are properly controlled. And that means that when we're doing our dying, we're not going to be disturbed by encroaching pain or breathlessness or whatever the symptoms of the illness might be. So at the time when we start to become unconscious, 
we need to swap from taking those symptom management drugs as tablets or as medicines and have them as injections because we can't reliably wake up to swallow medications. It's an important distinguishment there that you're making that dying does not cause pain. It could be there could be pain already there from an illness because a lot of people fear dying because they fear pain. Would yeah, that be yeah. right? That's absolutely right. But the, the process of dying doesn't necessarily make the symptoms of the illness itself become worse. It might make it more difficult to take the medications that control them. So you might need to switch to a different way of having the same sort of medicines. But the only symptoms that actual dying causes is gradual loss of consciousness and then some changes in our breathing until our breathing eventually stops. So getting the symptoms right early is a really good kind of insurance policy for being more likely to be comfortable over the last days and hours of our life. And to get the the symptom control right and get it right early, are we relying on our medical team, our nursing staff, or should we ourselves be having conversations with people about symptom control for ourselves or for our loved ones? Like, how do we how do we make sure, like for somebody, for example, who is anxious about dying and anxious that they might experience pain, how should we give them the tools to avoid that or to put their minds at ease? Should they be, what should they be doing? I, th- I think that's a really great question. So whatever illness we have, we will be being looked after by a medical team. So often a, a, a doctor, maybe a group of nurses. If we're lucky, there might be additional healthcare professionals, occupational therapists, physiotherapists. So so one of the things for us to think about is that it isn't always drugs that are the best way of managing a particular symptom. So um, if you're a person who's got a, a lung complaint that's making you very breathless, it might be that um, having piped oxygen would be great for you and just the right treatment or it might be that that won't really help your breathlessness but it will tie you to being the length of an oxygen tube away from an oxygen cylinder for the rest of your life so you're having the oxygen for reassurance but it's not really helping your breathlessness does that right. does that make sense or or it might be that you want to know that you've got a great supply of painkillers in the house just in case you need them, where if you haven't had a particularly painful illness so far, it's not likely to suddenly change its character and become more painful. So a really honest conversation with the doctor or the nurse specialist or your community nurse who understands you and understands your condition is probably a really helpful thing. And knowing that this person will be honest with you and say, well, you know, your illness is heart failure. It's generally not a terribly painful illness, but it can cause you to have swollen legs and your skin can feel tight. Or you might get a little bit of fluid accumulating in your lungs and that makes you feel breathless. So this is what our plan is going to be. If your legs are tight, we're going to have this approach. And if you're breathless, one of the really helpful things is to be sitting more upright and lying less flat, for example. So it could be very practical things like the the shape of the pillows in your bed, or it could be a physiotherapist that's helping to release spasm in your legs because you've got a problem with your back, or it might be drugs to help those symptoms. So having a good plan in advance, that, that can be really helpful. The thing that people find very helpful is to talk through what the sequence of events at the very end of life can be. And the first time I ever saw this, and it's one of the stories in the book, was actually because a lady was fearful that she would have overwhelming pain at the end of her life. And it wasn't just that she was fearful that she would have overwhelming pain. It was that if she had that difficulty, she would then feel despair and that that would be a mortal sin because she was an elderly French Catholic lady and that was a a really important thing to her. If she despaired in God's goodness on her deathbed, she couldn't go to heaven. Mm. And if that were to happen, she would be separated for eternity from her husband who had died well, having said all of the prayers with his priest as he was dying after a heart attack about 10 years previously. 
And that's a really great illustration of how if you think the person's concern is just pain and you go into, oh, well, you know, this is how we'll manage your pain. You yeah. miss the real concern is, which is actually the consequences of the pain in a, in a physical and emotional and in, in a spiritual existential way. So my boss went to talk to this lady and he said, come with me, that this will be interesting for you. And I went to listen to him. And I was a young doctor in palliative care. I hadn't been in, in the hospice for very long. And uh, he said to her, you know, I, I, I hear that you've been worried about having extreme pain at the end of your life. Um, and I thought that wasn't a very subtle introduction to a conversation, but actually she really trusted him and he had a great relationship with her and it was exactly the right introduction to the conversation. So here's me with kind of five years of hospital medicine experience, but actually really knowing nothing. And here's right. him with all that wisdom. And this lovely lady in her 80s or 90s. And he said, so um, have you ever seen anybody die? Do you know what dying looks like? And I'm thinking, that's a really weird question. Um, oh. He's asking her, of course, because he wants to know what it is. What's the picture in her head? And yeah. she'd seen her husband die, composed, um, coming in and out of consciousness, being able to have the last rites and join in with the prayers. And she'd seen somebody die of gunshot wounds during the war. So that those were the only two deaths she'd seen. So then he said to her, what, you're, you're worrying about what the very end of your life is going to be like. Would it help you if I described to you what we see as people are dying? And now I'm feeling really anxious. I'm thinking, did he really just say that? That just sounds like you can't possibly, you couldn't possibly describe dying to somebody. And she said, that would be really helpful. Yeah. I'm feeling increasingly awkward i'm parked on one of those tiny little feet elevation stools beside the bed and he's sitting on the bed chatting to her and, and so he starts off by by discussing as you and i have just discussed how um people get more and more tired and you know they have to sleep longer to have any energy between sleeps and he said to her perhaps you're noticing that already and she said we and um he said oh that's good and i thought you can't say that's good. That's really not good. And and he said, no, no, that's good because that shows us that you're following the normal pattern. That's great. So the next thing that we notice is that people start to have episodes of being unconscious. And, you know, he offered to say these things in French because he actually spoke French. And she said, no, it's all right. In English is fine. Um, he said, and so we might then have to use a different way to get your painkillers. Um into you but we won't stop managing your pain and eventually we see people are just unconscious all of the time and I thought oh well he'll stop now because he's got to unconsciousness and she's sitting further and further forward kind of eyes locked on him almost like she's mesmerized by this conversation she's nodding she wants more and I'm feeling more and more uncomfortable and he said to her so now when a person is completely unconscious, the thing we see is the only part of their brain that's still working is the bit that controls their breathing. And we start to see the breathing become automatic cycles. So it goes between deep, quite sighing breaths. People don't realize that they might be breathing with their vocal cords a little bit closed. Um, so if that happens, we'll make sure that your family understand that you're not groaning and you're not trying to speak that's a sign of being deeply unconscious and some of the time the breathing cycle moves from that deep sighing breathing to shallow quite fast breathing um, and we'll be sure to explain to them that that doesn't mean you're panting it's not breathlessness it's this automatic breathing cycle of being deeply unconscious so we'll make sure that they understand that you're not feeling any distress and this cycle of deep breathing and then shallow breathing, fast breathing and slow breathing carries on. And over time, we start to see the breathing is becoming slower. It's having quite long pauses. And then at some point during that slow breathing, there will be an out breath that just doesn't get followed 
by another in-breath. There's no sudden rush of pain at the end. There's no feeling of panic or choking or fading away. It's very, very gentle. It's sometimes so gentle that the people around the bed haven't realised that it's happened. Hmm. So people won't see something that terrifies them. They won't be left with nightmares for the rest of their lives. We can't stop it from being sad for people who love you, but it won't be frightening. Mm. So, so he stopped, and by then, I'm just completely in tears, because what's just happened is she has relaxed completely as she's heard this description of dying. And I have just reviewed my last five years medical experience in a big acute hospital where I've seen already several hundred deaths. But I've always been the junior doctor whose job is to stop the person from dying. And I've never stood back enough to notice the pattern. And as he's describing it, I'm thinking, gosh, yes, that's right. That is that is exactly what happens. And I've never, ever put it together before. That is the pattern. That is what we see. And what a gift. I mean, what a gift he gave that woman. Absolutely I mean, wonderful. She was so becalmed yeah. by that. And as we, as we walked away with me kind of, you know, blowing my nose and wiping my eyes, <laughs> I, I, I had this epiphany, really, of thinking, do you know what? We can do this for people. We can say, hand on heart, that this is what we see as people die. And as long as the symptoms of the underlying illness are well controlled, yeah. dying is a comfortable and peaceful event of which the person who's doing the dying is largely unaware in their final moments. And what an enormous comfort it's given that terrified woman. And what enormous comfort that would bring anybody if you could just describe it in that sensitive, tender way of allowing them to explore their fears and then give them a vision of what is actually likely to happen. And, you know, yes. I've, I've had that conversation subsequently, obviously, with, you know, hundreds or possibly thousands of patients. I always say at the beginning, OK, so I'm going to offer to describe to you what dying is like. And, you know, you might feel a bit anxious about that idea. So if you tell me to stop at any point, I promise I will stop. Yeah. And nobody has ever stopped me. And at the end, there is always this kind of pause where they go, oh, oh, I think I can do that. And then always the next thing they say is, can you help me tell my family that that's not what any of us is expecting? Yeah. And what a difference it would make to so many people if they were to hear the process described in that way. I mean, you make it sound almost seductive <laughs> sitting here listening to you. So what, what you're essentially saying is conversation is key and just having an honest, grounded truth is so much more helpful than avoiding the conversation or trying to make it a sanitized version or a, a fluffy version of what's going to happen. I think that's so important. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting after writing this book um, and describing this process is the number of people who've written to me to say, well, do you know, I heard those noises as my beloved person was dying. I thought he was in agony. I have yeah. been traumatized by what I saw and what I heard because nobody explained to me what was going on. Yes. And that then makes me think, well, do you know what? Here's the other interesting thing. During labour, the midwife keeps saying to the labouring woman and her birth partner, you are doing so well. Do you know what? You do, you're absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it hurts like hell, doesn't it? But you, it's normal. That's great. Yeah, that bearing down feeling you've got. Yeah. Yes, that, that, that terrible griping pain that you've got. That's normal. You're doing well. You're doing this great. And we need to start midwifing dying. We need to be going yeah. into the room and saying to the family, this noise that your mum is making, this is a noise that tells me that she's deeply unconscious. You're doing great. 
you've got everybody talking around her if there's any hearing at all and it does seem that hearing might be preserved she can hear all your voices you, she knows she's safe she knows you're here you're doing a great job is anybody worried about her what are you worried about tell me what you're worried about so I can look too because I don't want her to be breathless and I don't want her to have pain or whatever her symptoms were so if you think she's got those symptoms I am going to check her yeah but also I am going to carry on saying to you look at how relaxed she is look how calm her face is I'm feeling her pulse now it's faint but it's regular it's not racing as though she's distressed yeah um you know so we're just kind of narrating what's going on like midwives do so that everybody in the room is on the same page and what we're doing is helping people to understand the process and begin the storytelling that happens in every family after a huge event women who've given birth tell the story don't they over and over and they need to a, to process yeah, yeah, it right of yeah course. and people who've been at a deathbed need to tell the story over and over and they need to compare notes but if they haven't understood what they've seen what they start to do is horrify each other by the misinterpretations oh my dad was in agony you yeah. wouldn't let a dog suffer like that actually your dad is deeply unconscious and he's breathing through half closed vocal cords that he doesn't know that he's doing and it's making a noise yeah and and that happens i know that happened in my own family i had googled what does de- what does dying look like this is you know quite some years ago before I was in the area of bereavement and I had read about the breathing and the noises and I was a little bit prepared which was great but another family member wasn't Mm. and it was actually years later that he said to me you know we were talking about my mother's death and I said oh it's great that she died so peacefully and he looked at me his experience was completely different because he had interpreted her breathing as distress and had lived with that for several years thinking that his mother had died in deep distress and it's so important isn't it that we help people to understand what's going on and it doesn't need to be a medical person or a nursing person that does that it just needs to be a person who's seen dying before and understands the process who's able to say do you know what this is normal this is okay he's safe yeah Um, and, and I really like this idea of the of safe dying that the space is safe, that the process is safe, that the yeah. person is safe. They may be dying, but they're not suffering yeah. as they're dying. Because it's what we don't know scares us. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be a scary process for anybody. What do you think of the concept of death doulas, Catherine? Well, I'm very proud to tell you that I'm a patron of a death doula association. I think it's an ah. absolutely fantastic idea. And I'm a patron of End of Life Doula UK. Okay. So, for, so for people who are listening who don't know what death doulas are, well, doulas traditionally, of course, are women who attend other women during a birth. Yes. And they're non-experts. They're not midwives. They are the companion. They are the gopher. They are the brow mopper. They are the the sole friend of the person who's giving birth to the baby. And in a similar way, death doulas often have come from um, nursing backgrounds or other health backgrounds, but don't need to have. They are simply companions who will walk with you through that last part of your life. And they might do things like go to clinic appointments with you. There are some people who want to go to the clinic and talk to their doctors and nurses about what's going on, but they don't like to have to try and deal with the distress of their family members who come with them. But their doula can go as the second pair of ears to listen because it's always better to have two pairs of ears and then they can come out and compare notes and say so what did the doctor say then right okay let's get this story straight so we know exactly what the doctor said right how are we going to tell your family that when we get home okay or the doula might be the person who's making cups of tea while your family is sitting around the bed as you're dying in the hospital the doula might be the person who's going out to top up the parking meter for you they will do Mm. what is needed so that you can be peaceful and relaxed they're looking after the dying person they're looking after the person who's important to the dying person and it's a step towards demedicalizing dying I think it's an absolutely great
great step forward. It sounds fabulous. I mean, somebody just holding space and getting some of the practical things done that we don't think about or can't think about when, yeah, when we're in that situation. Yeah. Yeah, and somebody who is familiar with the process, who can say to the family again, yeah. this is well, this is good. And also who's comfortable enough in the room to be able to help other people to become more comfortable. If you've never seen anybody die before and the person you're watching dying is somebody you love with great tenderness, that's really hard. And yeah. you don't quite know what to do with all that love and affection that you've got for them. Just to have somebody in the room give you a tube of hand cream and say do you know what it would be really nice if you just massage some cream into you, that dry skin over your dad's mm. feet uh why don't why don't you rub your mum's arm and if if i give you this mouth care kit what's your mum's favorite taste okay mm. so she prefers orange juice to coffee great let's stick some orange juice in this cup and then we're going to use this special little thing now to freshen up her mouth with the orange juice that she likes so much so instead of sitting around feeling helpless the doula is engaging the family in being active companions in comforting this person they live as they're dying they're lovely suggestions because they they call for physical connection to have that connection through the body through physical touch is lovely very very important and because we're you know particularly in the north of europe less touchy than perhaps our cousins who, who live in the south of europe yeah being given permission to touch and i have to say sometimes i make it up i just sometimes notice dry skin on people's legs that might not really be that dry, but it gives people, you know, and I've always got a tube of cream in my handbag. Yeah. I've lost count of the number of yeah. tubes of cream I've given away over the years, just to be able to say, you know, why don't you touch your mum's legs? And there are places in the body where you don't feel too awkward touching, so you're not offending people's body space and their intimacy, yeah. rubbing cream into somebody's feet, rubbing cream into somebody's hands, combing somebody's hair, mopping their forehead. These are things that we can do that give us a role and allow us to yeah. put our love into action. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And some, I think we need people to remind us. It's like, you know, as for my last episode of Shapes of Grief, I spoke with Hayley Manning, um, a lovely young girl in, or young woman in the UK who's had bereavement overload she's lost a lot of pregnancies and she lost uh, her baby daughter as well but we talk about when you're in that space it's quite surreal and you need people to suggest to you take a photograph or take your baby's handprint or footprint and um, dress your baby this way and the same way when we're accompanying like you said somebody we love with a lot of tenderness we need somebody else to be able to make those suggestions to us and guide us yeah, absolutely right. And particularly, I think that when children are involved, we tend to think, oh, children shouldn't be in the room. But actually inviting children to come in, say hello, talk to grandma or daddy or whoever it is, climb on the bed, give them a cuddle. This is still that person. Yeah. They're unconscious, their breathing's making a funny noise. But this is still that person. And actually, if the children are shut out of the room, they think something so shocking that they're not allowed to see it is going on. And their imaginations are so amazing. Yeah. You know, they, they, they live in a world where really terrifying things can happen. There are dragons and there are monsters. Um, so they, unless we let them see what's really happening, they would imagine something that's probably a lot worse. Yeah, they'll fill in the blanks. Um, mm -hmm. Catherine, I wanted to ask you something with a lot of people or some people that I would see, sometimes there hasn't been uh, a good death and sometimes they've lost a loved one through a long illness, but it still comes as a shock because those conversations haven't happened or sometimes they feel, why did the doctors not tell me? Why did they keep that away from me? You know, why weren't we told? I don't know what it's like in the UK, but I know that that sometimes does happen here in Ireland. Um, and I'm curious to know from a medical perspective, is that for ethical reasons that if the dying person does not want to discuss the end of their life or is still in denial, that we collude with that, you know, because if that's what their choice is? Or is there another reason? Is it perhaps just lack of 
experience on the doctor's part. What do you think about that? I I think that's a great question. And I think it's probably very many layered. So first of all, we've got a whole society now that's forgotten what normal dying is like. So in the first half of the 20th century, it would be normal by your mid 30s to have seen the death of at least one of your siblings, probably both of your parents, maybe one or several of your children. By the middle of the 20th century, we've got free at the point of delivery health services across the United Kingdom, antibiotics, better anaesthetics, good surgery, better intensive care, uh, dialysis, beginnings of uh, organ replacement. So over the course of my grandmother's generation, so she was born in 1900, and average life expectancy for girls born in Britain in 1900 was 50 years. So she should have died on average when she was 50. In fact, she was nearly 98 when she died because when she was 48, the National Health Service started and the technological revolution, which meant that instead of waiting at home to die, people could be sent into hospital in ambulances and be rescued from dying happened. So her children saw one of their siblings and their father die, but her grandchildren will not have seen a normal death happen until we were in our middle age because all of our siblings survived, our parents have survived into into their 80s, our grandparents have survived into their 80s. So society's forgotten what dying is like and society provides the people who go to our universities to train to be our nurses and our doctors and our other healthcare professionals. So we're training people to stop dying, but we're not training them how you facilitate normal dying when it can't be resisted any longer. So they themselves don't recognise it. And even if they do recognise it, they see it as an adverse thing. Oh, my goodness, this person's dying and I have to stop it happening. Yeah, or I've failed if I don't. Yeah, yeah. And then they don't think to say to the family while they're sticking up the drip and putting in the antibiotics and trying to get the blood pressure restored and all the rest of it. They they, they say, oh, so I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm trying to uh, correct their blood pressure and I'm trying to get rid of their infection and I'm trying to get the oxygen levels in their blood higher. But they've missed out the vital sentence, which is, and at the same time as I'm doing this, I need you to understand that at the moment, this person is sick enough to die. Yes. And actually, we need to be saying that this person is sick enough to die. I'm going to try to stop it. But in case we don't succeed, what else should we be doing? Is there anybody else who should be here? Are there any important messages that need to be exchanged? Does this person have any religious practice that we need to respect at this point in time? Um, I might have to sedate him in order to get him to lie still in a scanner. Is there anything you want to say before I give this sedative injection in case this is the last time this person is ever conscious? Those words could make all the difference to somebody at the moment this person is sick enough to die. Yeah. So last week, I had the great pleasure of uh, speaking to uh, the Society for Acute Medicine. So these are the guys who receive us at the front of the hospital when we arrived in our ambulance or we've been driven in uh, in the middle of the night by our friends and neighbours because we're so terribly sick. And And what we were talking about was actually parallel planning. You know, you bring somebody to hospital in the hope that they can be restored to health. But actually using that phrase, this person is sick enough to die. Let's do the things that would restore their health. Let's also do the things that we would wish we had done after they had died and be sorry we hadn't done them. Let's do that. Because actually, if somebody's sick enough to die and we make them better, that's great. But if somebody is sick enough to die and we don't do the parallel dying care and then they do die, there's only one chance to get it right and we've missed it. There's layers to this, isn't there? There really is. Yeah. Um, Catherine, when somebody's accompanying somebody through the dying process, what do they need to think about? So let's think about um, we're accompanying somebody who's very dear to us. So let's think about a spouse accompanying their spouse or adult children accompanying their older parents 
or let's think about the really difficult situation of parents accompanying their dying children or so, siblings yeah yeah so there is a set of people who are dedicated to the care of the person who is dying and it would be good to establish with them how much the dying person uh, gives permission for the care team to talk to their friends and, and family and it might be that there's you know some people who are allowed to know everything and some people that they'd rather they didn't know quite so much so let's let's try and respect the wishes of the person who's dying and now let's think about the companion and let's think about how do we keep that person well because this might be a really long haul for them yeah how do we ensure that they are eating enough getting regular drinks getting some fresh air, getting out for some exercise, getting some headspace where they can actually look after them for a little while. What are the things that keep them well? Is this a person who likes to sit and look at nature? Is this a person who needs to go out for a run? Is this a person who actually needs to go and sit in the pub for an evening with their friends and just have a beer and chew the fat? Because you might be helping to look after somebody that you love who is dying for weeks or months or years and you have to look after yourself because otherwise we'll end up with two sick people neither of whom is able to look after the other so it's okay to look after yourself it's not selfish it's actually the way that you make sure that you can be there for this person who you love who's approaching the end of their life you know that expression you can't draw from an empty well absolutely yeah You've got got to look after yourself so i see families who make rotors and that's fantastic. Um, when we're at the hospital or at the hospice and we're saying to people, OK, so this is the beginning now of that long haul um, where this person might be going to live now only for hours or days. So, um, you know, at home, you don't normally sit eyeball to eyeball and make conversation with each other all day and all night. You have companionable silence in the space in your home. And you chat from time to time. So let's recreate that here. Don't be in pressure to be constantly thinking of things to say. Bring your slippers in, get your newspaper, bring your book, make your living room in this bedroom around this person. What things would they like to have around them at home? Do they have particular smells that they like? Are there particular noises that they like? So, you know, when it's me, I want talk radio. Don't play your music at me but actually you might be completely different and you might want you know some I don't know you might be a jazz fan or maybe you're a, an acid house fan who can say nobody's going to know unless we tell them so when we think yeah. about our our idealized deathbed that might be things like who I want around me but it might also be make sure that I can't smell the toasting cheese <laughs> make sure that I can smell flowers or oranges I'd like a breeze on my face I'd like to be able to hear music mm. uh, I, I'd like to like to hear messages from my grandchildren and with you know mobile phones that can do little recordings and things now even when your grandchildren are on the other side of the world you can play play their voices so when you're looking after a person who's so sick that they can die look after yourself and then think about what you know about them as a person and how can you bring some of the things that have brought joy to their life into this room with them now at the very end of life. We're thinking about them uh, as a physical person, but we're thinking about their emotional and their spiritual and their friendship self as well. Um, it's OK to tell people not to visit. It can be very hard to yeah. limit visiting and what's really interesting at deathbeds is the people who think that they are important are often not the most important people and the people who don't realize how very valued they are don't visit as much as the dying person might like interesting and interesting we and we see it don't yeah. we yeah so i know we certainly see it in in grief that the people we think are going to show up for us often don't and most unexpected support comes from people you know where we never thought it would come from yeah yeah i think that's absolutely true so around a deathbed i think it's okay to recruit help to manage the visitors 
yeah. because, you know, it might be that the person who's dying was a great um, social person and they would want lots of people coming in and out, but actually only stay five minutes, please. Uh, or you might be a person who's always been naturally very quiet, introverted, thoughtful, like space, like silence, like quiet music. You're not going to suddenly want the world and its wife visiting you at this very, very important time. You might want only your very, very inner circle. So it's OK yeah. in consultation with the rest of the people who know that person best to draw up a list of who should we make sure does a pop in. And that's a farewell pop in. You say goodbye. We don't need you to come back every day. Yeah. And who do we want to be part of this inner circle of companions who are perhaps working on a rotor to keep that person company? And then the really, really important piece of information for everybody who's keeping company with the dying person is that really strange thing that so often we see is a person is accompanied constantly. There's a rotor, there's a couple of people in the room at all times. And then in the only 30 seconds yeah. that nobody is in the room, the person stops breathing. Yeah. And we don't understand why it happens, but it happens so much more often than can possibly happen by chance. We see that over and again. Over and again. And it mm. makes people's bereavement very difficult. They feel really guilty. I, was in, I wasn't in the room. Maybe he asked for me. We need to tell people. And at the hospices, certainly we warn people routinely uh, that this happens. And don't be surprised if it happens. It's OK. It's not your fault. What is it about? Is it that just those bonds of love are too strong for you to let go while everybody's in the room? We, we just don't understand yeah. it. We don't know what the science is. It's a phenomenon, it. though, that it that exists yeah. for sure. Mm. And so, Catherine, when we are the person facing our death, I mean, the more information um, that we can share with our loved ones about what we want, who we want, what we don't want, what our fears are, the better. Yet so many people... And I don't want to keep, you know, saying what we don't do or the negative, but lots of us don't say that because we don't want to upset people. But actually, there's nothing wrong with being upset. There's nothing wrong with shedding a tear. There's nothing wrong with grieving. It'll pass. And then let's get to the business of talking about our death wishes, because ultimately it'll make it so much easier for the family. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's, it's a real kindness. It's an act of love. Mm -hmm to talk about dying and this is um this is a, a, a really lovely expression that i've heard so greg's sister claire was dying of breast cancer and she was writing a blog and when eventually she was close to the end of her life the only person that she would allow to look after her was her brother greg wise and greg was the person who looked after his sister and his sister used denial as her way of coping all the way through the illness. Yeah. She couldn't bear to talk about what was happening and what was going to happen. But they'd been very close throughout their childhoods and he, he had a very, very good understanding of her and looked after with enormous tenderness over the very last part of her life. It's, it's absolutely wonderful to read his testimony and to listen to him talking about it. But Greg says, this discussion is an act of love. It's a gift to your family over the period of your dying. It's a gift to them in their bereavement to know that they were able to rise to fulfill some, most or all of the wishes that you had. And in a way, aren't we just kind of operating in the dark? We're just fumbling around guessing unless somebody tells us what it is that they would really like. So maybe it's a thing that we should do, you know, once you get to the age of maybe 30, every birthday with a zero in it, we have a little conversation about what I'd like if, you know, if, if I have to die during the next 10 years, this is this is how I'd like it to be. Mm. And of course, by the time you're talking about it when you're 60 or 70 or 80, you're now speaking about it with more life experience, possibly you've seen other deaths, possibly you know now what the illness or condition is from which you will die. Uh, possibly once you get to 70, it should be not just the zeros, but the fives as well. But it's a gift to our families yeah. 
to enable them when in the time when we can no longer tell them to be following instructions that they know we've already talked to them about. Absolutely. And I think I think what's key in what you've just said is we're not waiting till somebody gets a terminal diagnosis to have these conversations. Let's embroider them into our everyday life so that You know, it's normal. It's like somebody is ill or someone dies suddenly. Well, we know that she would have loved this and we know that this was her wish and we know that this is, you know, how she wanted to celebrate the end of her life, whatever. You know, when they're embroidered into every day, maybe not every day, but every decade or year, it it takes the charge out of it. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, you know, we are, in fact, spoiler We are, in fact, all going to die. It's quite interesting that people find it easier to start with what I'd like after I've died. So, you know, people will talk about their funerals more than Mm. they'll talk about their deathbed. And, you know, start where you can start, but don't leave it there. Once you've opened it up for exploration, keep moving around. We want to know what are the important things for the way you'd like your life celebrated after you've died. But we'd like to know how you'd like to be accompanied during your dying. And and we want your wisdom and we want your blessing to do it the best way we can for you. So don't make us guess. Please tell us. And I think also to look out for hooks, often people will try to open up the conversation and we sometimes might go, oh, don't be silly or don't talk about that or you're not going to die. But actually look for these hooks and respond to them because they, you know, they're a sign that somebody needs to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely right. And sometimes, of course, it's just you're just listening together to the radio or you're watching the TV or you see something on the side of a bus and it just gives you that little moment of oh that was an interesting article about Mm. um, the number of people who do or don't survive cardiopulmonary resuscitation I thought it was higher than that fancy it being so low okay now we're into you know would would I want to have resuscitation Um, would I want to not have it where could I get advice about whether that would be helpful for me so every time life offers us a little occasion little reminder that these are things we can talk about to just pick it up. I know that, you know, uh, on by averages, we're talking now in our relative youth and health, um, probably about the older members of our family being the next people to die. That's most likely, unless we've got members of our family who already have very serious and life-limiting illnesses. So, so how do we start that conversation and and the thing that I found really fascinating is the number of very elderly people who say to me I cannot get my adult children to talk to me about this yeah you know this oh oh mum don't be so miserable oh dad don't be so maudlin but actually because people live to such a great age they have a new secret weapon so do you remember when you were little and you did something so bad you couldn't tell your mum or your dad but you could tell your grandma well now people are living to the age where those children who really owe them one because they saved them from the wrath of their mum or dad are old enough to be adults themselves. And so I've got yeah. um, patients in their you know, 70s and 80s and 90s who can't have the conversation with their children who are in their 50s and 60s, but they can have the conversation with their grandchildren who are in their 20s and 30s. Yeah, interesting, isn't yeah. it? And then, you know, so then your grandson can say, Mom, do you know what? Granddad really needs to talk to you about this. It's on his mind and he'll feel better if he can talk about it. So, you know, we're we're making it sound as though it's terribly difficult. And I think maybe the recipe is start small, choose somebody who will let you talk about it. It doesn't matter whether they're your closest person or not. Just have a little go. Try it out. It might be easier with a person that you're less emotionally attached to. Play with some of the ideas. And then once you've worked out how you might say those things, maybe then you will want to have a go with a person who's yeah. emotionally closer to you. And as you said before, it, it might be sad. So have a little cry and yeah. then have a cup of tea and carry on with the conversation. Yeah, because the more we talk about it, the more we normalise it and the easier it becomes with time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Catherine, would you talk to us a little bit about your book, which I have here in my hand with the end in mind? (laughs) Well, I wrote the book 
really by chance, I had had one of those experiences at work of an elderly person being brought into the hospital where I worked with his adult children in their 70s, having shut down all of his attempts to talk about what might happen if he got sick enough to die. And now here he was sick enough to die and they didn't know what he wanted. Um, and, and it was sad and we managed his dying, but it made me think a lot about how somebody has to do something about the public understanding of dying because understanding dying, as we've already discussed, is more comfort than it is difficulty. And I kept thinking about how somebody needed to do something about the public understanding of dying. And it kind of gradually dawned on me that I might be somebody who might be able to do something like that. And I have to say, it didn't fill me with joy. It filled me with gloom, the idea of trying to do something that was yeah. publicly campaigning. Um, but I thought, well, OK, if I, if I retire a little bit early to make a bit of space, we could see what comes along. And what came along was actually an interview on the BBC on Radio 4 talking about dying, which only a short interview, but it was heard by a literary agent who approached me and said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And suddenly <sighs> there was there was what I was doing. So the book is really my attempt to replace what we lost by people coming into hospital to die. And so we're not seeing dying up close and personal anymore. So it's not a medical book at all. It is a book of stories about people who I and the teams that I've worked in have had the privilege of looking after towards the end of their lives. Mm. And it's really just to show how even when we're dying, generally when we wake up in the morning, what we're thinking about is living. We're thinking about getting on with the day. We're thinking about the people who are important to us. We're thinking about the things we want to do. And it kind of gently moves from stories that are about the mechanism of dying, including that story of my first boss in a hospice explaining yeah. about dying to, to that lovely French lady, through stories about different things that have happened to people who've been living at home, perhaps have been in a hospice, perhaps have been in the hospital, younger people, older people, just so that by the time you've finished reading the book, you've experienced the approach of the end of life, if not the actual death, of about 30 people. And it started to give you that sense of understanding what the patterns are and what the things are that seem to be important to people over that last part of their life. So uh, it, it isn't intended to be a textbook. It's intended to be very approachable. Each story is quite short, so you could just read one a day and it would take you a month to read the book. I've been a little bit flabbergasted by people who've got in touch with me to say, I loved your book, I read it in a day. I thought, my God, I would have run out of tissues if I tried to read it in a day. Yeah. Um, I've had quite a lot of messages from people saying, uh, you caused me to have tears on public transport, and that was a bit embarrassing. But when we talk about those tears, and I, I don't know what your experience about it is, it it's not so much sobbing sadness. It's tears of recognition of how just absolutely blooming amazing normal human beings are when they're put into extraordinary circumstances like the end yeah. of their lives and and what they come up with and how they deal with that and how being grateful for what they've had and telling people how much they've meant to them becomes the most important thing in their lives. People are just extraordinary and I, I feel very privileged to have had their stories to tell. I mean it's really the coal face of humanity you know, just like I said earlier, you make it sound so seductive because you ooze humanity when you're talking about the process, Catherine. And yeah, just to really recommend this book. I mean, we are all going to die, like you said. It's a beautiful book to read. And I know that just listening to you has settled my system. Thank you. So I, I, I absolutely loved writing it. I, I didn't expect, I didn't know that I could write, it turns out. It's mm. quite quite ni quite a nicely written book, but that's just kind of good luck. But the stories are 
obviously I had to change a lot of details to protect people's confidentiality because when I looked after those people, it wasn't with the intention of telling their story in 30 years' time. Yeah. Um, so the stories, lots of things have been changed, but everything that's in the book actually did happen to somebody last sometime in the last 40 years. And there are several stories where I couldn't change enough to protect the identity of the person. And I had to try and find families of those people from you know, 20 or 30 years ago. And that was extraordinary. That was so wonderful. Each of those families was so generous in saying, mm. yes, you know, we, we want this story to be told. We wish there'd been a book like this at the yeah. point where we needed it. Um, yeah. pe people have been so, so generous. And I've got lots of other stories, including some that I really would like to have included in this book, but I couldn't find the families to get permission and it felt that it was too exposing okay. to tell them. So I've tried as much as I can to to respect confidentiality, protect people, or if I couldn't do that, then to get permission. Well, you you certainly have a lot of a lot of beautiful, heartwarming stories in there. Um, maybe there'll be a volume two at some stage. Who knows? <laughs> Catherine, you're coming to Ireland in a few months, isn't that right? Do you want to say a little bit about that in case there's any doctors, nurses, or healthcare practitioners who might like to come and hear you speak? So yes. So in on the 24th of October. I'm coming to speak at the Forum for Ends of Life at Dublin Castle and I'm I'm incredibly honoured to be invited and very, very excited about coming to meet our palliative care companions and colleagues uh, from the Irish hospice movement. It's absolutely fantastic to be invited and I know that uh, there's been lots of inquiries already. I think this is a conference that always does fill up. Yeah. Um, so if people are keen to come, uh, they probably need to go onto the um, the Irish Hospice website to find instructions for how you how you sign up. Well, what I'll do actually is I'll put a link in the description of the podcast. Um, I'll certainly be there in Dublin Castle in October, and Great. I'll put a link in a link for tickets to anybody who would like to go to that and hear you speak, Catherine. Certainly, anyone in healthcare, I would say it's a must to go along. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a really good meeting. I'm I'm look, really yeah. looking forward to the whole day. They've got a great programme set out there. So, yeah, so anything I'm looking forward Ar to meeting people. Yeah, anything the Irish Hospice Foundation do actually tends to be great. So it'll be one to, to look forward to. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a gorgeous conversation. And yeah, thanks for just showing up. I know you've had a busy day in London today. So for taking time out, so Shapes of Grief listeners um, have the, the gift of your wisdom. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you, Liz. It's been an absolute delight. And I hope that even though we've been talking about some, you know, quite deep and difficult things, that it's going to have been useful to the people who are listening. It's, it's great work that you're doing. So it's been heartwarming listening to you. So thank you so much for that. Thanks and, so much. Uh, look, forward, look forward to seeing you in October. Yeah, see you in October at Dublin. Bye-bye. Great. See you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Shapes of Grief. This podcast is not a substitute for professional medical or psychological advice. If your grief is making you unwell, please do go to your healthcare provider. Grief is a normal part of being human. You are not alone. Join the Shapes of Grief community in our private Facebook group and find more support and useful links on shapesofgrief.com. Until the next time, from me, Liz Gleeson, stay well.